Good morning. Thanks very much for coming. I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of the co-host for today, the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise at Columbia Business School, and the Center on Global Economic Governance here at SIPA. Um, we're really delighted to have you here for what I'm sure will be a um, wonderful and provocative talk and discussion. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Dean of Columbia Law School and the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law, Julian Lester, to introduce this morning's speaker. Thank you. It's an absolute honor for me to welcome you all and to welcome today's guest and speaker, the Norwegian Minister of Finance, Ms. Siv Jensen. Ms. Jensen's political career began shortly after graduating from the Norwegian School of Economics in 1992. After serving as a member of Oslo's City Council and as a Deputy Member of Parliament, she became a member of the Norwegian Parliament in 1997 and has held leadership in, Norway, in Norway's Progress Party since 2006. Between 2001 and 2005, Ms. Jensen was the chair of Norway's Financial Committee, with her responsibilities expanding at various times to include foreign affairs and defense under her committee membership portfolio. And in 2013, she was appointed as Norway's Finance Minister, and she is here today with us in this capacity. She'll be sharing her experiences with us today in managing the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. Norway is a leader in sustainable development and responsible investment. And the government pension fund Global is a glowing example of the importance of considered investment regarding the benefits of non-renewable resources. In fact, the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment one of the co-organizers of today's event, uh, Lisa, the leader of, of the Center for Sustainable Investment, introduced me just a moment ago, reviewed the governance standards of 22 natural resources funds, and as you might expect, the Norwegian ranked first. Norway is also a supporter of the Sustainable Investment, uh, pardon me, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, based here at Columbia University which is working with the UN Secretary General's Office to help prepare the financing for the Development Summit this, sum this, uh, this summer. It's therefore especially fitting that a cross-section of our law, business, and international affairs schools are hosting Minister Jensen so that we can learn from her leadership in implementing best practice standards and assessing the longevity of investments on a global scale. We're delighted to have the Minister here with us today with that said, I give the podium to Minister of Finance, Siv Jensen. Thank you very much, um, distinguished uh, research, researchers, ladies and gentlemen. It's, um, it's an honor for me to, um, to give this talk uh, on uh, the management of the Norwegian Petroleum Wealth and the Government Pension Fund Global. I would like to uh, thank uh, the sponsors to this event uh, for hosting it. And let me only mention three of the many reasons why I've looked forward to this presentation. Firstly, we are happy to share our uh, experience in managing our uh, resource wealth. Resource management is important. Um, and for many countries, resource wealth seems to have been a curse rather than a blessing. Uh, we do not claim to have the one and only model that will suit all. But we have experience that can benefit other countries. And in all modesty, I think that Norway can claim at least some success. Uh, the first installment of um, the fund was made in 1996. Today, the fund is uh, considered one of the largest uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, wealth funds in the world. Uh, we have grown from zero to uh, 865 billion US dollars in 18 years. Secondly, in managing the fund, we have benefited from knowledge and ex uh, expertise found right here at Columbia University. Uh, it was agreed from the outset that the development of the fund strategy should be based on solid financial research and comprehensive professional assessments from leading experts internationally. Thus, it was natural for us to approach Columbia University and Professor Andrew Ang, 
who is considered one of the top academics within the financial research community. I would like to thank Professor Ang um, for his tremendous work uh, for the fund and valuable input over a period of almost 10 years. Thirdly, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the management of the fund at uh, one of the world's most prominent universities. The government emphasizes transparency in all aspects of the fund, and events such as this uh, help the fund staying uh, one of the most transparent funds in the world. Let me start by uh, giving you an outline of, of the topics that I will address. The fund mechanism, governance of the fund, how we have performed, and of course how we ensure responsible management of the fund. For thousands of years, uh, Norwegians have known how to harvest fish from the North Sea, but when we struck oil, we had to go abroad. We needed experience, technology, and funding. We needed international oil companies uh, from um, um, the Netherlands, UK, and the US. Foreign help aided us not only to recover oil, but to build up a knowledge-based uh, oil and gas industry that our entire welfare system rests on today. Oil was discovered in, uh, on the Norwegian sector uh, of the continental shelf in 1969, and production began in 1971. It took about 10 years before the government's revenues became substantial. In 2012, Norway was ranked the sixth largest exporter of gas and the 14th largest exporter of oil in the world. Petroleum accounts for roughly 20% of the size of the Norwegian economy, uh, around 30% of total state revenues, and about half of Norwegian exports. But the sector only employs about 1% of aggregate employment. The high share of GDP makes the petroleum uh, resources important uh, to the Norwegian economy. Moreover, they give us a fiscal leeway different from most other countries. When your university was founded in 1754, Norway was a rather poor country in uh, Europe. Today we are uh, in the Ivy League in economic terms. Oil and gas has indeed helped economic development in Norway, but petroleum is not our most important resource. The future earnings of uh, the labor force are by far the uh, most important resource also in uh, a resource-rich country like uh, Norway. A responsible economic policy is the best course of action to reduce Norway's uh, dependence on the price of oil. We will continue to save large parts of current oil and gas revenues and invest the savings in a well-diversified uh, global portfolio on financial assets uh, that reduce the dependence on the value of remaining oil reserves. Through the fund, we transfer oil wealth into financial wealth that also will benefit future generations. This graph shows that it is challenging uh, to be rich. Rich in resources. The evidence as documented by Columbia University's Jeffrey Sachs suggests um, poor growth performance in a number of resource-rich countries. There are several explanations for such a negative correlation between resource endowment and growth performance. The first is the, the Dutch disease and the lack of fiscal discipline. Large revenues, uh, revenue flows will urge labor to move out of traditionally uh, profitable sectors and into sectors that are booming from the spending of fresh petroleum revenues. As a result, sectors such as traditional manufacturing grow smaller and with the innovation capacity and potential productivity gains inherent in these sectors. At a, la a later stage, when revenue flows dry up, it will take time to rebuild production capacity and knowledge in traditional sectors and the economy will suffer from low growth. Bad investments. You invest too much at home with the intention of diversifying the economy. Loss of uh, focus on structural policy. You don't do unpopular reforms simply because you don't have to as long as the resource revenues are flowing. 
and poor governance. Resource wealth uh, is often associated with weak uh, government institutions. If you don't have the proper systems of handling the revenue stream, uh, this gives growth to rent-seeking activities. Whereas these explanations indeed bear some truth for some countries, it hardly applies to all resource-rich countries. Two aims guided the establishment of the fund. Firstly, we wanted a mechanism ensuring that the petroleum wealth benefits both current and future generations. And secondly, we wanted to shelter the domestic economy from overheating due to oil financed demand. The idea of uh, a petroleum fund was launched as early as in 1983. But then the aim was not to save for future generations. At the time, uh, it was limited confidence in the ability of the state to develop a long-term savings fund. The aim was rather to smooth out the spending of petroleum revenues over a limited number of years. But in the idea of a petroleum fund, um, uh, it matured in, uh, in 1990, uh, and the parliament passed uh, an act establishing the government petroleum fund. Uh, this um, chart illustrates the main principle for this wealth management problem, namely how to transform the oil windfall gain into a smooth development in consumption, enabling higher consumption over time. The issue is, therefore, that temporary and highly volatile pr uh, proceeds from petroleum activities should be decoupled from government spending. So, how is the fund mechanism working? All state petroleum revenues are transferred to the fund and invested abroad. This helps shelter the domestic economy and the exchange rate from the volata uh, volatility of petroleum revenues. The spending rule guides how much the government should use of the return from the fund to finance government spending. Over time, the government should spend no more than the real rate of return of the fund in order to preserve its real value for future generations. While the capital in the fund may be spent only once, uh, the real return enables a permanently higher level of government expenditure over time. The real return is estimated at 4%, but the spending rule allows for a flexible response uh, to the prevailing economic uh, conditions. In periods of high economic growth, spending is less than the long-term target of 4%, and in periods of economic downturn, uh, spending exceeds the long-term target of 4%. Large changes in the fund value may be faced in over a few years. The rule supports a stable economic development by allowing for a gradual increase in the spending. And it shelters fiscal policy from all price volatility and uncertainty. And automatic stab stabilizers uh, are allowed to work fully. There is no direct earmarking of petroleum income for specific spending purposes. But the government has emphasized that growth enhancing measures, tax reductions, spending on innovations, research and infrastructure should be given priority as the return from the fund is increased to finance government spending. The fiscal policy framework implies in principle a perpetual time frame um, for the fund's investment. Whilst the capital in the fund may be spent only once, as I said, the real return enables a permanently higher level of government expenditure over time. Norway has healthy government finances, low unemployment, and has seen um, years of high economic growth. But we also face challenges ahead. Over the next decades, Government spending linked to an aging population will increase rapidly, uh, as in most other OECD countries. Total petroleum production, however, already peaked in 2004 and will play a less important role in our economy going forward. This is illustrated in the chart to the right, showing a decline in uh, projected net cash flow from petroleum activities in the years to come. 
the rapid rise in public pension expenditure and a concurrent decline in oil and gas revenues represent a challenge to public finances, stressing the need to save a large par part of current petroleum revenues. The fund will help us in order to finance increased spending on an aging population. But we also need to focus on increasing productivity, not least in the public sector. And that is a key aim to the government. I will now present uh, the framework for the management of the Government Pension Fund Global uh, and the long-term investment strategy. The governance framework is uh, marked by a clear division of roles between, um, uh, with, uh, sorry, uh, of um, roles and responsibilities between the political authorities and operational management of the fund. The fund is the Norwegian people's savings. The parliament has given uh, the overall responsibility for the management of the fund to the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance determines a clearly defined benchmark uh, with risk limits, monitoring and evaluating the operational management. The ministry also determines the framework for the fund's responsible management. We report regularly to Parliament on all important aspects concerning the management of the fund. All significant changes um, to the fund's investment strategy are presented to Parliament before being implemented. This helps to ensure broad-based political support for important strategic choices. This again enables a robust and long-term strategy. A broad parliamentary basis and support of the general public for important elements of the fund management is a prerequisite for the long-term investment strategy um, to truly remain long-term. This is especially the case um, in times of uncertainty and severe market turmoil. The anchoring process served as well during the financial crisis of 2008, as members of parliament refrained from proposing any significant changes to the investment strategy, despite heavy losses in the equity portfolio. But the Ministry of uh, Finance is not managing the day-to-day -day operations of the fund. Uh, the operational management has been delegated to uh, the central bank, Norges Bank, which is responsible for implementing the investment strategy. The bank reports uh, on the performance uh, of the fund to the ministry on a quarterly basis. Norges Bank, the central bank, makes investment decisions on a purely financial basis and independently from the ministry. A clear and appropriate governance framework is a prerequisite for sound management of the fund. The government emphasizes a high degree of transparency in the management of the fund. Transparency is a prerequisite to ensuring public support for the management of the petroleum wealth. It builds trust and support for fund management, both domestically and internationally and it contributes to a robust investment strategy by anchoring the risk profile with stakeholders. The Ministry reports to uh, Parliament on all important matters related to the fund. We also publish all advice from external consultants, and you can find all these reports uh, on the Ministry's website. The Asset Manager reports on performance, uh, on performance risk and costs every quarter. Further, the manager publishes an annual report, including a um, listing of all fund holdings, uh, equities, fixed income, and real estates. And voting records are also published. Let me now move on to the fund's investment strategy. The overarching objective for the investments is to achieve the maximum possible return given a moderate level of risk. This enables more welfare to be financed over time by the return of the fund. The fund is not an environmental or foreign policy instrument. 
multiple aims will make it difficult to assess the performance of the fund. And we do not believe that the fund is an effective or appropriate vehicle in promoting political aims. The investment strategy is derived from our understanding of how financial markets work, together with the characteristics of the fund. And the fund is different from the average investor uh, in that it is large, it has a very long investment horizon, uh, has few needs for liquidity, and is government owned. These characteristics um, influence our risk-taking cap uh, capability and may give advantage in certain areas relative to other investors. The strategy is in particular characterized by diversification through investments in a global portfolio of equities, bonds, and real estate, the harvesting of different types of risk premia, including the equity premium, exploiting the fund's long investment horizon by inter-alia investing in unlisted real estates, a moderate degree of active management, that is, um, the fund follows the global benchmark indices closely, a responsible management taking into account environmental and social aspects, a cost-efficient management, and a clear governance structure. The investment strategy has been developed over time. It is based on comprehensive professional assessments and on assessments of risk and return in uh, the long run. In order to generate a satisfactory long-term financial return, one must accept risk, of course. The investment opportunity is accessible uh, to the fund, both with regard to uh, countries, asset classes, and financial instruments have been gradually uh, expanded. The fund investments are widely diversified across regions, countries, and sectors in order to reduce risk. And some milestones, as you can see here, are from, sorry, from 1996 to 1998, the fund capital was invested in the same manner as the central bank's uh, foreign cur uh, currency reserves. In 1998, we decided to invest 40% of the fund in equities. Uh, the equity allocation was further increased to 60% in the years uh, of 2007 to 2009, based on considerations of risk and return in the long run. Corporate bonds were included in the fixed income portfolio in 2002 to increase diversification. We have gradually increased the exposure to emerging markets both in the equity and fixed income portfolio. In 2011, the fund started to invest in unlisted real estate, introducing a third asset class. Responsible management is important uh, to the people of Norway. Ethical guidelines were introduced in 2004, and a more integrated responsible investment strategy was implemented in the new investment mandate in 2010. Several changes. Um, to the framework for responsible management were also made uh, with effect from January this year, and I will return to this later in my presentation. The fund is invested globally uh, with the following strategic asset allocation. 60% equities, up to 5% in real estate, and the rest in bonds. The starting point determining the investments uh, is the composition of the benchmark indices by the Ministry of Finance. We use standard indices, FTSE for equity and Barclays for fixed income. The geographical distribution uh, is based on global market weights for equities and corporate bonds. A market weighted portfolio reflects the capital available to the fund in global listed equity markets and uh, may be regarded as the portfolio of the average global investor. The allocation to government bonds are by and large according to the relative size of the country's economies as measured by GDP. The size of a country's economy may express the country's ability to repay loan and fulfill obligations better than market weights. The principles of market value weights and the GDP weights imply that the geographical distribution will change over time in line with market developments 
and relative GDP growth uh, of countries included in the index. Within specified risk uh, limits, the manager may deviate from the benchmark index set by the ministry. The actual investments in individual countries are thus determined by the manager, the central bank. The asset allocation implies that the fund is invested in a well-diversified global portfolio of equities, bonds, and real estates. The manager has used the leeway to uh, deviate from the benchmark to further diversify investments by adding markets and currencies which are not included in the index. At year-end 2014, investments in equity and fixed income instruments were spread across 75 individual uh, countries and 47 currencies and in excess of 9,000 companies and 1,100 individual issuers. The investment strategy states, as I have said, um, that up to 5% of the fund uh, value can be invested in real estate over time. At year-end 2014, 2.2% 2 .2 of the fund was invested in real estate. Uh, the central bank's objective is investing 1% in real estate in each of the coming two years. A higher portion invested in uh, real estate implies a lower proportion invested in bonds. The fund made its first unlisted real estate investment in uh, 2011 in Regent Street in London. The first unlisted property investment in the US was made in February 2013 uh, in three major U.S. cities. The purpose is to build a global portfolio of real estate. The strategy implies that the fund is a financial investor with uh, relatively small ownership uh, stakes in a large number of companies worldwide. The fund is not allowed to own more than 10% of any single company in the equity portfolio. As you can see from this chart, ownership is listed in listed companies globally averaged 1.3% at the end of 2014 and 0.9% for bonds. The equity portion is the single most important decision for total portfolio risk. A high equity portion means that we must be prepared for significant fluctuations uh, in the value of the fund from time to time. The fund has a high risk-bearing capacity. Hence, the strategy is not pr predicated on minimizing the volatility of returns. Historically, there have been large fluctuations in uh, equity returns, as shown in the chart. But over time, equities have strongly outperformed bonds. By its large size, the fund is to some extent confined to harvest risk premia in classical listed equity and fixed income markets, as many strategies are not scalable. Rebalancing rules of the fund's equity portion ensures that the risk and return characteristics of the benchmark do not deviate significantly from the fixed strategic weight. And the rule has proved profitable improving the ratio between risk and return. When equity markets uh, performed poorly in 2008, the fund sold bonds and bought equities to maintain the fixed proportion of 60% equities. In accordance with the rebalancing rule, uh, the fund sold bonds and invested some 150 billion US dollars in the world's equity market in 20, uh, 2008 and 2009. As the markets subsequently rebounded in 2009-2010, our additional investments in equities proved profitable. The fund's asset uh, allocation is different from other comparable funds. According to a study by CEM Benchmarking in 2013, other funds had allocated 3% and 8% to unlisted investments in infrastructure and real estate, respectively. Our fund has a cap on 5% real estate and has not opened up for infrastructure. On Friday, uh, the government announced a new assessment of investments in uh, real estate and infrastructure. The fund's special characteristics, such as size and long-term um, uh, long investment horizon, 
merit such a re review. The Ministry has appointed a group of uh, experts to assess whether the fund's current limit of 5% real estate should be increased and whether it should be opened up for investments in infrastructure. If uh, investment in unlisted infrastructure is permitted in general, um, the central bank will also be allowed to invest in uh, unlisted infrastructure within renewable energy sector and emerging markets. As with all other investments by the fund, such investments will have to be evaluated on the basis of expected returns and, uh, returns and risk. I will now briefly comment on uh, the fund's performance. The pension fund was established uh, by law in 1990, but the first transfer of 2 billion kroners was not made until six years later. Since then, the fund has grown rapidly and was per year end 2014 valued at more than um, 6,400 billion kroners, or about 865 uh, billion US dollars. This makes the fund one of the world's largest single-owned funds. The value has increased steeply in recent years, and it currently corresponds to about two and a half times the mainland GDP. Close to 54% of the value of the fund is due to net inflow of oil revenues, while 36% is due to returns on the investments and the rest uh, uh, currency fluctuations. The fund has become an important source uh, for funding of government expenditure. In 2015, the transfers from the fund will cover 11% of the total budget um, expenses. Return in recent years have been very favorable relative to the expected rate of return over time. This reflects strong growth in the prices of both equities and bonds, but as all investors know, we cannot always count on such favorable developments uh, in financial markets. A number of factors serve to highlight the considerable uncertainty as to developments in the value of the fund over the next few years. Bond yields are currently very low. In addition, net inflows to the fund is coming years, um, in coming years depend on the development in the price of uh, oil, which is subject to considerable uh, uncertainty. And the fiscal policy guideline calls for the petroleum uh, revenues to be phased gradually into the Norwegian economy, more or less in line with developments in the expected real return. The real uh, rate of return was estimated at 4%. So how does this expected return compare to the average actual annual return on the fund? Since January 1997, to December 2014, it has been, as estimated, 4%. A group of experts, chaired by Andrew Ang from this university, assessed two years ago uh, the performance of the fund. They concluded that the management performance has been good. Uh, the group also recommended building on the good results by increasing the scope for deviations from the benchmark index. They referred to four activities believed to add value diversification, rebalancing, including enhanced indexing, exposure to systematic risk factors, and security selection. These are all activities that the fund is currently undertaking. And last Friday again, the government presented plans to increase the limits on deviations from the benchmark index in order to take further advantage of such activities to increase the return on the fund. The government emphasizes ethical awareness uh, in the management of the government pension fund. We also believe that over um, the long run, uh, sound financial return is considered dependent uh, on a sustainable development in economic, environmental, and social terms. The people of Norway um, want assurance that the fund capital is invested in accordance with uh, responsible investment practices. The strong public opinion on the issue is underlined by the fact that members of uh, the Norwegian Parliament initiated the process of establishing ethical guidelines for the fund. The first ethical guideline uh, came into force in 20, 2004 after a comprehensive public hearing 
on the principles of the guidelines. The Ethical Council was established the same year. In 2013, we received advice from the Strate Strategy Council to, for the fund to further strengthen the strategy. New measures were introduced in 2014, including a new division of responsibilities for the exclusion of companies. The Ministry of Finance decides on the overall framework for responsible management, including the guidelines for observation and exclusion of companies from the fund. The Central Bank exercises the fund's ownership rights, while the Council on Ethics makes recommendations on the observation and exclusion uh, of individual companies. Until 2014, the Council of, uh, on Ethics gave independent advice to the Ministry on Finance uh, on the uh, exclusion of companies. Due to changes um, to the framework for responsible management from January this year, um, following the discussion in Parliament last year, uh, the decisions on observation and exclusion of companies are now carried out by the Central Bank. To preserve the legitimacy of the fund and to ensure that the investment strategy may in practice remain long term. It is vital that our ownership in the various companies worldwide is generally acceptable to the Norwegian citizens. The strategy for responsible investments is transparent and predictable and based on internationally recognized standards and principles. The overall purpose of the ownership efforts is to safeguard the fund's financial interests. As part of uh, Norges Bank's, central banks, work on responsible management, the bank has developed a number of uh, uh, strategic focus areas, uh, of which three are related to good corporate governance, and three are related to environmental and social issues, including children's rights, climate change, and water management. We have uh, several instruments at our disposal to promote the fund's role as a responsible financial investor. Exclusion of companies is one of these instruments. Companies shall be excluded from the government pension fund if they produce certain products or sell weapons to specific states. Companies may also be excluded if there is an acceptable, uh, unacceptable risk that they contribute to uh, or uh, are responsible for grossly unethical activities, including serious or systematic human rights violations and gross corruption. Forty companies are excluded from the fund under the product-based criteria. Eighteen of these companies have been excluded on the basis of production of weapons that violate uh, fundamental humanitarian principles in their normal use, whilst 21 companies are excluded for producing tobacco. An additional 21 companies are excluded under the conduct-based criteria, and 13 of these companies are excluded because they are de deemed to cause severe uh, environmental damage. The disinvestment movement has uh, had an impact in Norway as well. NGOs and several members of uh, the parliament have argued that the fund should disinvest from companies engaged in coal production. Some would also like to exclude oil and gas companies. In April 2014, the Ministry appointed an expert group to look at how we should address the issue of climate gas emissions from coal and petroleum companies. The expert group presented its report in December last year, and the report included several recommendations. Active ownership and engagement are the appropriate primary tools to address climate-related issues. The fund should continue to support relevant climate change research. New exclusion criterion, contribution to climate change. However, the expert group does not recommend an automatic exclusion of all coal, uh, of all coal and petroleum producers from the fund. There is no ethical basis for exclusion of the coal sector, fossil fuels will stay, uh, will still be paramount to economic development in years to come, also with the new ambitious climate agreements in line with the two degree targets. 
the ownership efforts should be the primary tool and the exclusions and engagement processes should be well coordinated. The fund should not function as a climate policy instrument. Use of the fund as a policy instrument beyond what is uh, compatible with its role as a financial investor would be both inappropriate and ineffective. The government agrees that ownership efforts is the most efficient tool in addressing climate issues in the management of the fund. Investors need to have a seat at the table to be able to influence companies' conduct. Uh, the central bank has already implemented many of the recommendations from the expert group in this respect. In addition, the government has proposed a new exclusion criteria based on conduct related to greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Let me uh, turn back to the initial, uh, initial um, issue about how large natural resources uh, impact policy and uh, the lessons from uh, Norway and avoiding the so-called resource curse. Yes, the fund and the way we have managed our resource wealth has indeed benefited the Norwegian economy. And it provides future generations with a share of the wealth. But let me also be very clear. We have our challenges today and ahead. This article uh, from Financial Times in February 2014 referred to a uh, Norway on cruise control. In this article, the Financial Times referred points to low average annual hours per worker and a rapid increase in unit uh, labor costs. Our high GDP per capita, it claims, uh, is largely dependent on oil. This picture of the Norwegian uh, uh, needs to be qualified. For example, uh, participation in the workforce is uh, high, so the hours worked per capita are on par with the EU average. Uh, the largest part of our income stems from the mainland economy, not from oil and gas. Uh, but still, it's important to make sure that the large uh, oil revenues do not result in uh, complacency. We need to spend the revenues wisely. We still need to make the public sector more efficient reduce red tape and bureaucracy, and reduce the overall tax level to keep a steady growth in the overall economy. The investment strategy and management framework for the, uh, for the government pension fund global um, do by no means represent a universal idea, but rather reflect the political and ideological context in which the fund operates. If I should try to summarize some of the key experiences from Norway's way of managing uh, large petroleum wealth, I would highlight the following. We have chosen a framework where we separate spending from current accrual and where the proceeds are invested abroad. A well-designed fund mechanism serves as a tool to support wise and long-term budget decisions. Further, the management is uh, premised on a clear governance structure in which the parliament, the Ministry of Finance and the, the central bank, as well as internal and external asset managers, all have different roles and responsibilities. Clear lines of responsibility are prerequisites for good asset management over time. We place significant emphasis on a high degree of tr transparency. I believe this is essential for the public and Parliament to have confidence in the management of the fund, and it would not have been possible for the state uh, to accrue such large and visible um, financial wealth without being open about the manner in which it is managed. Another key feature is that the fund's investment strategy has been developed over time based on comprehensive professional assessments. We have also stressed that the risk in the management of the fund must be managed, um, controlled and communicated in a clear and effective manner. Furthermore, to be able to assume uh, this risk, one must anchor the uh, overall risk profile of the investment strategy with key stakeholders. Broad political support uh, for the main features of the fund management is imperative uh, to being able to stay firmly on course through challenging markets uh, and environments. 
The Norwegian economy is open to trade and investments. With a small population, we benefit greatly from international trade and economic interaction. The fund has made us even more dependent and interested in developments internationally. At the end of 2014, uh, the fund's investment in the US alone added up to uh, 277 billion US dollars. So, maybe this is not the last time you have a visit from a Minister of Finance at Columbia University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Jensen. We're very lucky because uh, the Minister has agreed to take open questions from the audience, which I think is a terrific opportunity to learn more about um, the activities of the fund. Um, I'm going to have to set a few ground rules for the, for the questions. The first being, um, if you have a question, please, use the, please just line up on the side here and, and use the microphone so that everybody can hear the question very clearly. Um, this, the second point I would ask you to do is, is uh, keep to questions, not statements, uh, if you don't mind. And uh, do please try to keep your questions fairly short so that anybody who wishes to ask a question has the opportunity to do so. We have about half an hour uh, to, to, to ask questions of the minister. And the last, uh, last uh, point, uh, which I think is very important to make, is uh, please focus your questions on policy issues, which the minister is responsible for, as opposed to very technical issues on the fund itself. And uh, if you have questions, please go up to the mic. Um, while people come up, uh, maybe I can open with, with one question, Minister Jensen. You uh, refer to excluding companies, uh, which occasionally happens. Uh, does the fund also uh, engage in proxy votes or investor activism through the fund? In, what's, in what sense does that occur? Yeah, the, whole <laughs> the whole idea of um, um, the management of the fund is by um, ownership uh, participation. So yes, the answer to the question is yes. Mm. Thank you, Minister, for a really fascinating presentation. Two questions that follow up, I think, on the last one. First, how do you, how do you manage domestic pressure to invest within Norway? And similarly, how do you uh, respond to and manage demand for greater social or political screens on the firms that you invest in? Thank you. If I could also ask if you could just, uh, your name and what part of Columbia you're affiliated with. Gene Ross with the Ford Foundation. Well, thank you for uh, your questions. Um, I think the, the first question I, I sort of touched upon in my presentation, um, the fact that 11% uh, of the budget now comes, stems from, um, from the fund uh, actually says it all. Uh, I think we, we have uh, an agreement uh, on spending more of the petroleum revenues um, in the budget from year to year, and it's increasing from, uh, from year to year as well. Uh, so the, I think that the main debate in Norway is, um, has, has uh, had to do with two things. How much can you spend from one year to another? And the other debate has had, had to do with how to further uh, develop the strategy of the fund. Uh, introducing ethical criteria, introducing uh, uh, new aspects to the um, uh, responsible investment strategy and so forth. So uh, I think to, to, to the final part of your question, um, uh, I wish actually I had someone here from the central bank with me to answer some of those direct questions because they, they uh, carefully assess uh, all the investments that they make, uh, whether it's in um, in stocks, bonds, or uh, real estate. Uh, uh, but I think that the overall strength of the fund is, is the uh, responsible um, uh, strategy that we have, uh, participating at the table, discussing uh, uh, strategies with the owners of the companies. Because I think that um, I, have, I have reflected a lot on this in, 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 in debates with different NGOs that always have a different agenda or a specific agenda to, to, to their um, uh, hopes for the fund. Um, but I think that we, we end up making a, uh, a difference when we participate in ownership debates instead of just closing our, um, uh, or turning our back to the companies. We can, we can affect them more by, uh, by participating than just by, by uh, uh, withdrawal. 
So I think that's part of the responsible strategy that has developed, and um, that's why we can actually make a difference in, in the, through voting and through through uh, uh, discussing with the different uh, companies worldwide. Hi, Minister. Uh, my name's Howard. I'm from a uh, student at SIPA. Uh, just a quick question. I noticed from your uh, from your presentation that over the years, it seems that the risk appetite of the fund has grown. Uh, you've gone from 40% equities to 60, and now you're introducing uh, infrastructure, potentially, and, and real estate. And I've heard rumors that you're getting involved in uh, potentially private equity investments as well. Um, from the perspective of the people who you represent, is this increase in risk appetite, or this increase in risk, uh, acceptable? And is it, uh, have you had buy-in from the people that they're happy with, uh, with the potential uh, returns, but also the potential losses uh, that, that come with that? Thank you. Well, thank you, Howard. I think that's actually a very good question. Um, but I, I, I don't agree, uh, because I, th I think that, uh, I, I don't think we do have a risk appetite at all. I think we're quite risk averse. We are, um, um, we are, diversifying the portfolio step by step, uh, especially when the fund is growing. The larger the fund, uh, the more diversification is necessary in order to spread risk. Um, I mean, the overall, the overall perspective of the fund is uh, to be a financial investor. Uh, but this is uh, the Norwegian people's um, uh, pensions we're talking about. So we need to, we need to be pretty risk averse. We need to have a diversified portfolio. And we constantly need to look into how we can improve uh, the investment horizon of the fund to reduce risk, especially in a situation where uncertainty is increasing. Uh, and that is, uh, I mean, not only to, to the, the Government Pension Fund Global, but I think to, to many other funds uh, worldwide uh, with uh, increased uncertainty, you need to look into how you can um, uh, improve uh, the mechanisms of, of uh, how you invest. We have not decided yet. I mean, I, I hear rumors all the time <laughs> about the funds. Not all of them are true, okay. I have to say. Uh, we are slowly uh, developing the strategy of the funds, step by step, year after year, uh, but only through a broad consensus in parliament. And I think that is actually the critical point to this. We have broad consensus to all changes in the uh, in the fund's strategic um, investments to ensure uh, uh, a broad support to what we do. So what we are, and, and what, what, what we are always doing is that we, we seek professional advice. Uh, if uh, we were to make changes, how should we do it to, to make sure that it is implemented in the best way possible? So now we are assessing the possibility to open up to other uh, investments. Uh, and that will, we will conclude on uh, one year ahead. But we have not concluded yet. Thank you. My name is Lucia Cannon, and I am an alumna of Columbia University. And uh, I wanted to ask you about your socially responsible investments. And you mentioned several aspects of it that basically are traditional, especially for Europe. But in the United States, the uh, you know the social the social uh, socially responsible investment is defined somewhat differently. And for it, for example, it includes such aspects as promotion of entrepreneurial activity, as you said, innovation, through uh, recruitment of what is called emerging managers, which is small managers that are innovative in their investment strategies. And usually, and uh, institutional investors, and especially in Europe, I find that, that they only do business with the largest managers that have billions and billions of dollars. And in the United States, because of uh, social considerations, but also uh, because they very often perform better than actually the big banks, you know, the institutional investors in the U.S. promote these emerging managers. And I wanted to see if you uh, are doing it right now and if you are considering doing it in the future. Well, I, <clears throat> as I said several times, times through my, my, uh, my lecture, uh, I believe that we have a very sound, social responsible um, uh, 
uh, cr criteria for investing in the fund. But the overall uh, perspective of the fund is to be a financial investor. There will always be um, uh, interests wanting the fund to take on a clearer um, for, uh, role as a foreign policy tool uh, or as an uh, environmental policy tool. Uh, but that will make it difficult to achieve the overall goal of the fund, namely to be a financial investor. Um, but the whole idea behind us developing ethical criteria um, has to do with um, what we see as um, uh, acceptable uh, investments uh, now and in the years to come. And that is why we, year by year, uh, further develop the strategy of the fund. But we, we are sort of um, we're moving very slowly on this. Very carefully, we assess all the changes that we make uh, thoroughly. Uh, and, as I have said several times, uh, only through uh, broad acceptance through Parliament uh, and their decisions for, before we implement changes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Berger. I'm with the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law here at the Law School. And um, so my questions are going to be about climate change. Um, in evaluating risk for the investments that the fund makes, uh, to what extent does the fund look at the risk of stranded assets in relationship to fossil fuel companies in particular? And more broadly, to what extent does the fund look at the risks that climate change poses to investments underlying assets, infrastructure or otherwise, as a general matter? Thanks. Well, stranded assets has been discussed um, a couple of times, uh, but we have not concluded in, uh, uh, in uh, criteria concerning that. But especially over the last, I would say, five, six, seven years, uh, a more increased focus on climate change issues, of course, uh, concerning the governance of the fund. Uh, and that's one of the changes that we made, well, actually proposed to Parliament uh, last Friday, was a, a, a new criteria. Uh, as, I, as I referred, I'm, I'm not sure if you're too familiar with, with uh, the, the, the Norwegian debate on this, but as I said in my, in my lecture, we, we've had a debate on whether to exclude from uh, coal companies and from time to time a debate on to exclude from oil and gas related companies. But as I said, that's, that's not necessarily a good idea to, to develop criteria on, on that sort of exclusions. What we have uh, developed, um, based on the advice given to us by, uh, by the expert panel, is a more, uh, I think it's a, it's a broader criteria actually, to go after uh, the severe climate problems uh, in, in different companies worldwide. So I think it gives the, uh, it gives the, the manager and the, uh, the um, ethical council, ethic council uh, um, a more flexible criteria, actually, to, to go after um, um, the, the real problems concerning climate change issues. So I think that's a better way to do it. Because, I mean, today they talk about coal, tomorrow they would talk about something else, and then you have to develop new um, exclusion criteria every time someone comes up with uh, a new idea to, uh, to, for what to exclude on us. So I think a broader-based criteria is better uh, and gives a better uh, uh, flexibility to, to the fund manager. Yeah. Good morning, Minister, and thank you for that uh, insightful uh, talk on the Norwegian Petroleum Fund. Uh, my question is basically uh, on two of the policies regarding the expenses out of the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, first is uh, basically I would like to know whether you have any policy for because when you narrated the items of expenditure like reduction of taxes and all I want to know whether there is any policy regarding development of alternate and clean fuels either within Norway or say globally whether the fund is encouraging any such initiative second is uh, uh, when you look at uh, many of the asset managers one of the concerns that they are facing today uh, especially in the context of diversifying of the portfolios, like NICE's looking, investing in many of the emerging markets. 
uh, it is having a concern on the growing asset management fees and it is trying to rein in either having that asset management done at home so do you face a concern especially since you are diversifying into this many number of uh, uh, economies and also say now looking at investing in real estate is asset management fees uh, a concern for you and if so what is it that you are do, uh, doing with regard to that one thank you well of course we look into asset management fees uh, but i believe that we have a, a good record on that they're quite uh, low um, and something to be quite proud of i would say but of course when we when we uh, uh, expanded the strategy to, to go into uh, real estate. Uh, the central bank had to build up a lot of um, uh, competence before they started um, uh, investing in real estate because that's quite different from investing in uh, stocks and, and bonds. Um, so it took a long time from the decision was made until they, uh, they bought the first uh, property. So they have actually developed that strategy over time uh, based on um, uh, clear views also on asset management. So I think, I think um, we have um, quite solid results in that respect. So um, to, to the, your first part of the question is, I, this is a fund that is globally invested, but not in Norway. Uh, the point is that we, um, uh, the return is invested in Norway into, through the budget and spent on, uh, as this government has said, growth enhancing measures because I think that's quite critical for the Norwegian economy as we speak. Uh, but then we take all other considerations uh, on what we uh, want to um, uh, put priority on through budget assessments and through parliamentary uh, discussions. And I think that's the way to do it. The fund is sort of separated from um, the day-to-day the -day political decision-making. Uh, and I think it's, it's a, a very good idea for the fund because that gives the fund the ability to be uh, very long-term, very transparent, and I think it gives um, uh, more strength to the funds and investment uh, portfolio that it's, it's very um, uh, foreseeable. That it doesn't change from, from week to week or month to month uh, after any uh, political uh, decision makings in parliament. So we, we make these decisions once a year after uh, thorough um, uh, assessments and then we take all other political considerations through, uh, uh, through the budget and uh, other parliamentary decision makings. Other questions? I mean, the minister's presentation was so um, all-encompassing that it seems to have uh, limited the number of questions. But if anybody else does have questions, please come up. I I'll pose one more question if we don't have any others. You must face um, a, a challenge with the balancing act between how much the fund's resources are spent today versus in the future. And to a very specific question that I think is relevant to, to almost everyone in this room, how do you make that balance around the issue of education? In other words, how much, how do you decide how much the fund's resources go to educating the younger people of today as opposed to reinvesting, say, in the U.S. for pensions of the future? Um, is, that, is that something that comes up and must be managed as in your role? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Can you sure. elaborate a bit? Sure, sure. So one of the, one of the big issues here in the U.S. is, of course, the high cost of education. I don't need to tell anyone in this room about that. Um, and um, the very limited amount of government support that is available today. Uh, there are many reasons for that, some political and some economic. But the simple fact is investing education is a large expense today that has a payoff long into the future. Um, in Norway, you are um, in a very fortunate position that you can invest today into assets, you can invest into education, you invest in you have so many demands on the investment. Mm -hmm. How do you make that balance between what is spent today and what is spent for the future? Mm. Maybe there's no answer to that question. <laughs> well, um, I think um, 
all governments are, are um, um, uh, concerned with uh, the education systems uh, in their own countries and they want to improve it. Uh, hopefully not by just increasing the costs on the, uh, the education, but improving the quality of it. And we have that debate in Norway as well. Uh, and we were just presented with, uh, I, I set down a productivity commission uh, just after I um, uh, started up as a, a minister. Because I believe that we had some uh, improvements, um, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way, um, mm -hmm. in productivity gains if we were to make some changes. And some of, some of the findings uh, from the commission was that uh, we definitely have a way to go considering our education system uh, and public sector as uh, in general, even in, in infrastructure building. So, so I think that's the discussion that we will we'll continuously uh, have and see how we can uh, put into place uh, uh, changes uh, in our policy making in order to achieve a better um, uh, rate on productivity. But when it comes to the, the fund's investment, I, th I mean, as I said, this is a globally invested fund. It goes into companies uh, all over the world mm. with different perspectives. So the whole point in not reducing the, the investment uh, horizon too much is for the fund to be able to invest in all kinds of, of, of uh, interesting companies, but based on a uh, based on the, the bank's risk assessment before they take, uh, take on a new investment. So that's that sort of decision made by the, by the bank based on the overall criteria that we have drawn up. Okay. Well, one last question, then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Uh, hi, Minister. My name is Jorge Tirado. From, I'm an LLM student in the Columbia Law School. Um, my question would be the, the, the following. If you, were, uh, if you were advising a resource dependent countries that are willing to build up a, um, uh, a strong fund, uh, what would be your, your advice um, to avoid political actors to get involved in the management of the fund? Um, I know you have mentioned um, several things throughout the talk, but I would, out, I would like to ask uh, three policy measures that you would um, say right away to, to resource-dependent yeah. countries that have the desire of building a strong management fund? Mm. Well, that's a very good question, an extremely difficult one to answer. Um, because I think it has to do with uh, uh, each country's uh, willingness, ability to, to follow the criteria drawn up. I mean, you can have all the good like, intentions when you draw up a set of criteria in, in managing a fund, but those intentions can vanish quite quickly if, if, you don't, um, if you don't stick to them. And that's what we have done in Norway uh, through different governments. Uh, we've always had a very broad uh, political consensus behind all the decisions in, in uh, changing the uh, investment uh, horizon of the fund. Um, but that was not given uh, when we started this up. We, I don't think we even thought that we would be able to do it ourselves, but we have. So I, th I think that uh, we, we received, and we have for, for many years, delegations from, from different parts of the world seeking advice on how we have set up our fund. Uh, and we gladly share that. But I think you have to put into consideration some of the um, specific issues concerning each individual country and draw up, um, uh, draw up the, um, uh, the criteria based on that. But I think the, the best advice is that it, when you draw up, some, uh, draw up an investment strategy, stick to it. Don't, don't, uh, don't create misunderstandings by changing it rapidly because that creates uncertainty. And of course, uh, um, it, it, it will weaken the interest of uh, any national fund. Thank you, Minister Jensen. Please join me in thanking the minister.